section. We're, we're moving to look at the other side of this motion unit. We've just did kinematics, the study of how objects move. Right? So once they're moving, we're, we're analyzing their motion. We're figuring out how fast they're moving. Where did they end up? Um, how fast are they moving at a specific point? We're shifting gears a little bit into dynamics, the other, the other half of mechanics. And it's a study of why they move in the first place. So when you kick an, when you kick an object, you're the reason why it's moving. You're applying a force to it. Okay. So essentially, the next month or so is about forces. So if you want to jot that down, you can get that down. But it's just the dynamics this definition is why objects are moving. So if I use the word kinematics and dynamics, Back and forth, that's what I'm doing. Kinematics is how, dynamics is why. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's quite sketchy. This is recording, so it's, it's like screen capturing it. No, yeah, it's kind of sketching out. <laughs> Didn't do that before. All right, you will, you will find this unit Pretty tricky to get your head wrapped around. Hit your head wrapped around it. So as we go forward, you're going to start learning um, more and more new words, or I should say, words you've heard of before and maybe not used the same way. Okay, so the concept of forces tends to be more challenging in terms of this course. So the stuff we just did, it's pretty it was pretty mathematical. Not too bad. You know, most people tend to do the math better sometimes than the concepts, like the writing out the definitions of the words. This one, the math, the math we're going to do at first is multiplying two things together or adding or subtracting. The tricky part is what gets added and what gets, set, gets subtracted. There's no set formula I can give you. Sorry. Phone silent. I've got an email. So, the First thing, though, is just for you guys to do a little bit of reading, and so we'll do that every now and then in the in this unit, in your textbooks. So page 126 to 128, as you're going through, you don't have to read through diagrams or that kind of stuff. Just look at the text, and there's a few questions here to answer. You can, I guess so. All right, let's see if it's working. Anyone want to jump in there and define inertia? So I'll summarize it again in a second. You all experience inertia every single day, especially if you drive here or if someone else is driving and they're a little sketchy on the brakes or the gas. Right? It's an, an object with, with mass. It's resistance to the change in motion. So it's not a, a resistance to motion. It's change. So you can relate to that. If you're just standing there and say you're very heavily built and you're muscular, someone comes running into you, they're going to bounce off of you. So your motion doesn't change. Right, theirs did. Right, so you, you have a higher inertia. You resist that change in motion. But the other way around, if you're small, maybe a little lighter, and someone larger hits you, you go flying. Picture football players. The small ones, they go, they're gone. Or someone hits the brakes in the car, you, you lunge forward until hopefully your seatbelt catches you. Wear them, by the way, so you don't get thrown out of your vehicles if you get in an accident. My God. And so that's that's inertia. That's your body staying in motion. And it does relate to, as Alex said, it relates to Newton's first law that we get to in a few weeks. But objects in motion will stay in motion unless something happens and that something is forces. All right. Summarize, summarize Galileo's thought experiment on inertia. Anyone find it? What's the summary? What is it? What did you get? I think you said an object will naturally remain at rest or in uniform motion unless acted on by an external force. Is that what you said? Good. So most people don't catch the word summary right there in your textbook. So that's what that that's what I'm getting alluding to. And you could replace the word summary with Newton's first law of motion, really. So there has to be some kind of force on an object to change its motion. That's why it moves. That's the dynamics part of things. So the thought experiment summary is that objects in motion will stay in motion or, or their natural state of motion, be it at rest or moving, unless there's an external force. So once you throw something, 
The only reason it falls is because of the force of gravity. If there was no gravity, it's gone. It's going to keep going. It won't stop. Speaking of gravity, question three, describe inertial and gravitational mass. Are they the same? So they're, they're not the same? You sure? They're not defined to be the same. Let's work with that first. Describe inertial. What's inertial mass? It relates to what you wrote down for definition of inertia. It's the resistance to motion or resistance to external force. It's acting on a mass. Right? I haven't even checked. We'll keep going. So inertial mass is the objects. It's a it's a word used by physicists or scientists to represent an object's change in the resistance to change in motion. What about gravitational mass? What's that? Coming across that one? A property of masses that cause them to interact. Another way of saying that is the gravitational force of attraction, the force of gravity. So two masses gravitationally attract each other. And the gravitational mass is related or going uh, revolves around that property of masses. You know, in grade 12, we calculate the gravitational force of attraction between any two masses. Right? So between me and any one of you or any one of you, each other, you can calculate the force of gravitational attraction. It is very small. You'd never be able to measure it. The Earth's mass is, mass is so great. So, oh. so inertial mass is like Inertial mass is just the the property to resist change in motion of an object. It really just goes back to the definition of inertia. So are they the same? No. So they are the same? Okay, last sentence in your page 128. In fact, Einstein, in his general theory of relativity, showed why inertial mass and gravitational mass are fundamentally the same. So they're, it's the same thing. Different definitions, but they are, well, I think you said it right, Brianna. They're the two same property, two different things are the same property. So inertial mass, gravitational mass, they're describing kind of two different situations of the same property of having mass. Okay. So then Einstein showed that. Some question four. Now you know exactly what would happen with question four. If you kicked a bowling ball compared to it with the same amount of force you did a soccer ball, what's going to happen to your foot? Broken. You're going to curse. You're going to swear. Be, some people will laugh at you. You'll curse and swear even more. Right? You are going to destroy your foot. Why? Does not have the same mass? Half marks. That's what we're looking for now. You've, now we've got to use that word inertia. The bowling ball has a higher inertia, or if you want to write it out in words, has a larger resistance to the change in motion. Since it resists the change in motion, your foot is now going to move, move by breaking. Right? So. So I like to ask a similar question on tests just to make sure you're using the word inertia or its definition. Okay. So if I say what's going to, if I give you this question and I say, what's going to happen if you kick a bowling ball versus a soccer ball with the same amount of force and why, if you just say your foot will break or you will get hurt, one out of two, you've got to finish up and saying the bowling ball has a, li a larger inertia, resistance to the change in motion. Right. Here's what we're getting into now. Forces. Yes. We won't be choke crushing anyone's trachea or anything. It'd be cool. I'd like to do that. It'd be awesome. But I haven't figured it out yet. But lots of different forces have different words, but are the same thing. There's airplane. There's forces on airplanes, thrust, drag, weight, lift. Fundamentally kind of the same forces as driving a vehicle on the ground. You still have a an applied force from the motor pushing the car forward. There's wind resistance, there's friction, there's gravity pulling down, 
and the road is pushing up to keep it from falling through the road. There's lots of different things. So then we're going to explore all these different types of forces as we kind of move forward. So a few little notes. Right? The easiest definition in physics, and when George Lucas did Star Wars, he got it right. Force is defined as a push or a pull. Um, you can write everything down here. Yeah, it's all good. The, the bowling ball, you, there's two ways in. You could just say the bowling ball has a higher inertia. Or say the bowling ball has a larger resistance to change in motion, which is the definition of inertia. All right, so just Continuing with what's on this page, force, push or pull. Anytime you push or pull something. So when you walk, there's a force, there's an interaction between your feet and the floor. So you, you can actually move forward. We'll talk about that later on. They are vectors. Okay? Direction matters, really matters. That should kind of make sense, especially given the cartoon that's there. I love this cartoon. School for the Gifted. Thor says pull. And you characters pushing. I've seen that happen many times. So your direction is really, really important. So when we go to do the math, direction is going to define whether or not a force is positive or negative when we're adding them together or multiplying by other values. If you add all those forces together acting on an object, it's called the resultant force or net force. We're going to be calculating that a lot. Just add them all up. Some could be negative. Newton's second law, when we get to it, deals with net force and the relationship between net force and acceleration. That's a few weeks away. But we get there. So net force, we're going to be doing lots of work with net force. Really want to get our heads wrapped around it. Let me know if I've gone down too far. Uh, yeah, we'll have this in your notes, and that'll be pretty much it. with me. Forces break down into two types. There's lots of different types of forces, but in terms of whether they use contact or non-contact, category them, categorize them that way. So contact forces, literally, the objects need to touch, and non-contact forces, force that acts over a distance, like gravity. You do not need to be sitting on the surface of the earth for gravity to affect you. That's the reason why you can't leave the surface of the Earth for an extended period of time. Uh, so examples. So contact forces, friction, tension. So if you're pulling a rope, right, or holding something up. Normal force, applied force. I'll talk about normal force in just a second. That's a weird one to learn at first just because it uses the word normal. And normal in physics doesn't mean normal in English class. Just to make life difficult. And forces that act over a distance, gravity, magnetic force, electric force, and you've played with magnets, you've maybe played with balloons that were charged, right? They attract or repel each other. That's acting over a distance with no direct contact. Those forces are creating a force field, literally. All right. 
just as you're copying down those, those examples, we're going to be kind of writing or looking at each of these force uh, individually in a, in a few moments by the end of class. Normal force, just so you have it in your head, is the force that's perpendicular to a surface. So when you're sitting in your chairs, you're not falling through your chair because the chair is exerting a normal force upwards from your force of gravity pushing down. So force of gravity tries to pull you down, your chair holds you up, so that's called the normal force. It's, it's perpendicular to a surface, and that'll be, the word perpendicular is very important, because I could be pushing up against a wall, and the normal force is not, not coming off the ground, it's now coming out of the wall. So we'll be looking at examples of those kind of things. You don't need to write this bottom note down. It's just a summary. These forces, you, you could have an object experiencing just one or all of these forces at the same time. The process of problem solving for the net force is independent of the type. It doesn't matter what kind of force it is. The net force is add them all up. If you've got the force of gravity that's acting on an object and a magnetic force is acting on an object and they're in opposite directions, then one of them is negative, one's positive, and then you add them up. Calculating what those forces could be using their own set of equations can be tricky, but ultimately the net force is the same, same relationship, add them up. And that's what that's kind of the hard part of the math. In a previous unit, we could read a question and go to a formula and fill it in and get a value. In this unit, you read a question, the formula doesn't, there's not a single formula for every situation okay? because the formula can't take into account every type of force. So when you look in your handbook, the net force is just, it says it's sum of all the forces. So you don't, you might have an applied force and a force of friction and a magnetic force, or maybe you have a force of gravity and a force of tension. So I, the handbook would be 13 more pages of a force problem, force equations, if I tried to do every single one. So that'll take some practice, is using the force mathematical relationship, but in re problem solving and reading the question and, then, and doing the net force. We'll get to that later. So we're gonna, we're gonna focus on forces one at a time. First one we'll look at is gravity. Right, we'll do a little bit of math with this one. So you don't have to write down all these pictures, but force of gravity leads. Uh, we spend a good deal of time on grade 12 working with force of gravity. We look at a little more detailed mathematics of it. You can get the definition down. Is it uh, big enough to read? An attractive force over a distance between masses. That is all. Yeah, definition of force of gravity. So it's not specific for, to the Earth or anything. It's just an attractive force that acts over a distance between masses. It keeps the moon going around the Earth. Keeps the Earth going around the sun. Keeps the sun going around the galaxy. Keeps the galaxy moving towards another galaxy. Kind of governs the whole structure of the universe. As far as, as forces go, it's pretty weak. Feels strong because we can't just easily leave the surface of the Earth. But as, uh, as a lot of these other forces go, that's, that's actually pretty weak. It's just the definition. There, there'll be a little discussion note down the bottom, but we don't need to write that down. Everyone got that down. Just, yeah, but, so again, when you guys leave here today, you're not going to have many questions or maybe one or two math questions, if that. Good idea to review your notes. What dynamics is? What's inertial mass? What's gravitational mass? What's a force? Right? The types of forces we have. Just in case I forget to tell you later. You don't have to write this down. A little discussion. What do you think? What object's responsible for the tides? Here's a hint. The moon. Good. All right. That's easy. The moon is responsible for the tides. You learned that very early. Which object has the greater gravitational pull? Is it the Earth-Sun system or the Earth-Moon? So if you calculated the force of gravity between these, which two objects? 
Earth Sun or Earth Moon? Earth Sun. Earth Sun. Not bad. Now the the Moon's a lot smaller than the Sun, but it's a heck of a lot closer. Are you still sticking with that? Good. Earth Sun. So why doesn't Earth Sun cause the tides then? It's a stronger gravitational pull. But you're right. It's kind of something to do with it. It is far away. Well, we're going around the sun. The, the orbit of the moon does have a little bit of an effect. Not as strong as making the whole thing. So just a long story short, and I'm not going to do it all the math. In grade 12, I like to do the math of this. It, and it's not complicated. It's, it's just another formula. But the Earth's sun has a stronger gravitational pull. So the force of gravity from the sun is like 200 times stronger than the Earth-Moon gravity or gravitational pull. But it's the moon that does the tides. The difference is, and if you look up the definition of a tide without you know, the water coming in and receding and coming in, the definition of a tide in physics is the change in force with distance. So if you go one meter closer to the moon, the force of uh, gravity between you and the moon changes a little bit. If you go one meter closer to the sun, the force of gravity changes a little bit between you and the sun. The change is greater as you go towards the moon. So it doesn't have to do with the actual force between the two objects. It has to do with how the force changes as you kind of get closer to the other objects. So as the Earth, as if you could move from the Earth to the moon, your force of gravity is changing at a greater rate than the force of gravity if you started moving towards the sun. And it's that change in force which is responsible for those tides, okay? literally on Earth, the, the whole water and ocean bulges and this and that. It's because the force of gravity change is greater to go to the moon. That's a, like a little bit more sense if you take grade 12 or if you do some calculus, because when you do calculus, that's what you do, the math of how one variable changes with another. You do calculate all of it. No, the closer to the moon, the higher the force, but it's also the higher, the higher the change in force compared to the sun. And so, I did. I don't have the math calculated here. It's in my grade twelve notes. So let's just pick a number. Um, might be like, if you go one meter closer to the moon, it's like ten to the negative eight units of force stronger. But if you go one meter closer to the sun, the change is like ten to the negative ten. Like it may not be that big of a difference, but it's still a difference. So the change, the force of gravity from the moon, it's change when you subtract one value from another value. The change. Yep, that's the key to the whole thing. It's good. You're thinking about it. All right. Here's just a little bit of a fact, mind-blowing, whether you know, well, mind-blowing to me when I first learned it way back when. These interactions of the Earth-Moon tide, it's making the moon go, now. make this stuff up. Well, I could, you'd believe it, but I won't do that. It's resulting in the moon moving further away from the Earth, and the Earth's spin slowing down just a little bit. Every, continually slowing down a little bit. Moon getting further away, it's about a centimeter a year. And they've confirmed this because there are mirrors on the moon, and you can shine a laser and measure the length of time it takes for that laser beam to get back to the Earth, and it takes just a little bit longer each year. Like they, can, they can measure that precisely. But that energy, okay, the energy to get the moon moving farther away is coming from the Earth's spin. Right? So that the Earth is slowing down just a little bit. Now, it's not going to continually slow down and come to a stop, but at some point in the distant future, you're only going to see the moon if you're on a certain side of the Earth. So right now, you know, the Earth just, the Earth, moon keeps going around the Earth, but at one time they're going to be locked. So say it's our side, we would always see the moon. The other side of the Earth would never see the moon. It's going to be locked, tidally locked. Well, if you can, if it's not too bright out, but yeah. It'll, you can still see it at nighttime, but the other side won't. So that might affect tides a little bit. It's still going kind of in its orbit, but it's always facing the same side of Earth. Now... To not worry about that, the Earth could be long destroyed by the sun as it evolves and gets bigger before that ever happens. So, you know. All right. Where are we at? Another little reading break. Any other?